Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come along and address the Historical Society. And uh, thank you for all of you for uh, coming out uh, this evening. I um, appreciate that uh, very much indeed. You know, um, as Baptists, I'm sure you would all agree that we don't really go in much for uh, pictures of saints or holy relics. But I have got both with me tonight. Here's my picture of a saint, uh, Saint Hugh of Machrafelt. Uh, this photograph was on my fa uh, father's uh, desk at home. And then after my father died, uh, I took it and it was on my desk as I um, uh, was in the pastorate. So that's Pastor H. H. Orr. And uh, uh, there is a, another photograph here of him as a, a younger man. Um, uh, so that's my picture of a saint, a saint in uh, the true biblical sense of the word. Um, I also have a holy relic here. This is a very precious holy relic. It is a Bible which belonged to Pastor H. H. Orr. Um, uh, when it was given to him uh, by uh, the inscription is to Pastor H. H. Orr, 50 Rochester Avenue, Craig of Belfast. That's when he was pastoring the East End Church. That's where he lived. And it's from his friend Bertie Hutchinson, uh, 26th of September 1952. So that's my father. And he gave um, this Bible to Pastor Orr. I don't know why. I don't know what the significance of the date was. But he gave it to him. And then when Pastor Orr died, Mrs. Orr gave it back to my father. And then when I was going into the ministry, my father gave it to me. So that is... A very precious holy relic and um, it was obviously a Bible which Pastor Orr used a great deal. It is written on every page. Uh, there's markings, there's underlinings, there's points uh, at the front and back. He has a summary of some of his sermons. You know, uh, he has one on Matthew 11, 28. Uh, he has three points. Come, take, Learn. You know, if you read the verse, Jesus says, Come on to me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you upon, and learn from me. Uh, learn that my uh, yoke is easy and my burden is light. So um, he had the three points, come, take, learn. And then come is living through Christ. Take is labouring with Christ. And learn is learning from Christ. So come is salvation, take is service, learn is study. Uh, and then he must have felt that didn't exhaust the alliteration because his first point we are, are come as sinners, take as servants, learn as students. So it shows you, you know, something of his homiletical approach. He liked to take a, a verse, he liked to have three points, and he liked to have uh, some alliteration for each of them. So that's uh, my holy picture and my uh, holy relic. Um, let, let me just say a word to how I came to, to write this and some of the sources I used, and then we'll get into the life of, of Pastor Orr. Uh, um, are, are there many members of the Orr family here? I see Janet and, and uh, oh yes, Janet and Hugh. And are there a few others? Oh, there's, there's quite a lot. Well, there's Gareth. I should have recognised him, isn't it? Is it Gareth? Oh, no, it's... It's not Gareth. Robert's older brother. You're his older brother. It's just I've seen Gareth recently, and so you reminded me of Gareth. So uh, my apologies to uh, to those members of the Orr family um, that you didn't, maybe don't get much of a look in here because uh, I I really was dependent on what Hugh and Janet gave me. Um, um, so most of what I'm saying tonight. 
really, uh, some of it is personal reminiscence because I was a member of Great Victoria Street. No, sorry, I wasn't a member of the Great Victoria Street. I was only a wee boy. So between 1957 and 1966, I was between the uh, ages of seven and 16. So you can work out my age from that. So. Uh, so that's where I was, uh, that's how I knew Pastor Orr, really, but Hugh and Janet had uh, Mrs. Orr's scrapbook, which they kindly passed on to me, and uh, I'm dependent upon them for the photographs, so every now and again I may have to look to you to tell me what exactly or who exactly it is in the photograph, I'm not sure about, about all of them, but uh, dependent a lot on what Hugh and Janet have, have given to me on all my personal reminiscences. And uh, also uh, Robert Fitzpatrick, uh, who was a member of Great Victoria Street, and he wrote a history of uh, Great Victoria Street uh, Church and covered the years of Pastor Orr's ministry there. Uh, I was, uh, got a lot from that. And also at the time when Pastor Orr was there, Robert Fitzpatrick was a member of the Youth Fellowship and they put on, I think it was in 1960, a This Is Your Life program. And uh, uh, Robert Fitzpatrick gave me the script which he had uh, for that uh, occasion. Um, the only other source, I think, was um, Bert Caldwell was a member of... Uh, East End as a young man when Pastor Orr was there and uh, uh, Bert um, in his retirement has been transcribing uh, the notes of Pastor Orr's sermons that he preached when he was in East End so I don't know <laughs> you have to find something to do when you retire so <laughs> Bert couldn't think of anything better to do than to transcribe all Pastor Orr's uh, sermons that he had. Um, there are a couple of articles in the Irish Baptist Historical Magazine, uh, one by Pastor Boggs about the South Derry Evangelistic Association and about a pastor, um, McKillen, I think it was, who was a pastor in Tobermore. Uh, and then there was a, an ar another article uh, by Pastor Boggs. Um, as well. So those are the sources really. So I just thought I'd, I'd let you know. And it came, uh, how it came about that I ended up writing this was, was really basically during COVID. And uh, I, I, I had these materials to hand and so I did it. All right. So th this is the result of, of that. So let, let, let's uh, start then. And uh, the the Life and Ministry of Pastor H.H.R., 1904 to 1973. The growth of the, of the Christian church has largely been through the faithful labours of ordinary men and women that God has chosen to use and bless. And Hugh Henry Orr was one of these humble servants. Through his ministry during the middle years of the last century, God brought great blessing to many individuals and churches in our province. His life and ministry provides us with an example to encourage and inspire us today. You know, the author of Hebrews says, uh, remember your leaders, those who preach the word of God to you. And I think Christian biography, uh, next to the Bible, maybe Christian biography is one of the things that's most helpful to us in our Christian lives. Just to read the stories of men and women in the past and what God achieved through their lives. And to me, Pastor Orr is a great example of that. As I said at the beginning there, I was only a wee boy in the church at that time. Uh, but his ministry and his life have had a lasting impression on me. He was, uh, this is him as a young man. He, he was born on the 29th of June, 1904. The youngest of six children, he had a sister, Maisie and four brothers, Alfred, William, Thomas, and Robert. His parents were Robert and Lucinda. Um, her maiden name was McQuillan. His father had a small farm at Kilfaddy, uh, 
on the Ballyronan Road near Machrafelt in County London, Derry, and this is where Hugh grew up. His father was a member of Wood's Church. This is Wood's Church of Ireland. And uh, I don't, is it in Machrafelt itself? Just outside. Just outside. Yeah. Uh, his father was a member of this church and a lay preacher there. But sadly he died when he was only uh, 46 on the 10th of December 1912. Hugh was only eight years old at the time. Um, and we can only really imagine the sadness which this loss brought into young Hugh's life. His mother then seems to have taken the children to worship in the Methodist church. I think that's the Methodist church in Machrafelt. Yeah. Uh, where she had grown up. Now she was a woman of strong Christian character. In her obituary in the local paper in January 1949, she was described as being of a bright and cheerful disposition, most tolerant in her dealings with others, and it was stated that in early life she yielded to the claims of her Lord, and during a long life she adorned the doctrine of God, her Saviour, in all things. By her transparent character and integrity of life, she won and retained the respect of all classes in the community. It was quite an obituary if someone... Uh, could say a few nice things like that, I'm sure, about us. I'm sure we would be pleased. But the point, really, I want to make is that Hugh grew up with a strong Christian influence in his home. And we can never underestimate the importance of that. Those of us who've had the benefit of a, a Christian home, a Christian mother and father, uh, it's incalculable, really, the, the benefits of that. He was educated in the old Fairhill National School, which was attached to Machrafelt Presbyterian Church. Here he received a good grounding in the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and also in the Bible. Here the discipline was strict, but again there was a strong Christian influence. The principal was Master John Stewart, an elder in Machrafelt Presbyterian Church. He left school at 14 and had no further formal education. Later on in the 1920s, when his preaching gift was being increasingly recognized, he considered going to the USA for Bible training. He thought that he would be able to find work and support himself through college. He applied to the Moody Bible Institute and then the next year to the Omaha Presbyterian Seminary, but he was refused a visa on health grounds, so nothing came of these plans. However, both he and his brother Robert were avid readers and read books on history, uh, particularly the American Civil War uh, and the generals on both sides, uh, current affairs, theology, and discussed them together uh, when they were working on the farm. After he left school at, at, at 14, he worked on the family for, farm it must have been a struggle to make ends meet, you know, back in the 20s. Uh, it was quite hard going. My, my mother, the rest of my mother and father will come into the story a bit more later on, but my mother grew up on a farm outside Kilray, a small farm, and uh, she later told me that it never, they never made any money, or her father told her that he never made any money until the war came. So it was always a struggle to work those small uh, farms. But he, uh, it seems that Maisie, Alfred, Thomas and William all emigrated to North America sometime, uh, it must have been in the 20s, I think. Um, so I, th I think it really left Hugh and Robert are uh, together at home on the farm to work at. Um, someone told me that Hugh was able to plough with horses, uh, which apparently was a great skill, uh, and not everybody could do that in those days. But he worked on the farm. He knew what it was like to get up early and to work hard. Um, long before he turned to his spiritual labours, he knew what it was like to labour uh, physically. Um, 
He was an Ulster countryman by birth and upbringing, and he always retained his strong South Derry accent. Years later, when he was resident in Belfast, his favourite form of relaxation was to escape to the country and go fishing. Um, and that, that's some of my earliest memories of him, of going with him and my father to fish uh, rivers like, I don't know if I've got this right or not, but I, I seem to remember somewhere called the Agive. Anybody know the Agive River? Yes. Uh, Achidui, is there a river at Achidui? Moyola, uh, Six Mile Water. I, Apparently they were f fly fishing and um, never caught anything. <laughs> All I can remember was one day going with them and I actually, and I was only about nine or ten at the time, caught a salmon and they just had to stand back and admire my <laughs> handiwork. Um, but you know, he, he was a countryman, that's his roots, you know, he's a, a strong Christian family background, a loving family, um, he has a, a limited education, you know, he, he wanted to have more but he couldn't, those were the days before there were really any night classes or correspondence courses, uh, so all through his ministry really he was a self-taught man, you know, he was an avid reader. And he loved history and uh, later on theology. I think Spurgeon was uh, probably his favourite author. Um, but uh, that's a bit about his early years and background. So his conversion then and his first step. Well, before I go on, that, <laughs> that's some of the family. Now, you may, I think that's Janet and Hugh at this end, isn't it? Can can you add, uh, are any, anybody else here? Who, who, George. Which, are you Willie, Willie, George, yeah. Willie George or just George? Willie George. Willie George. He's the youngest. The youngest? He's the youngest. Of right. And are you in there somewhere? Yeah. Well, that's the next gen. That's not, I, I don't really have any of his. Well, I think later on we have a picture of Hugh H.H. with... Um, a couple of his brothers in America, but this is some of the family here. Is there a Lucy there? Lucy, as some of you may know, got married in the snow in 1961. <laughs> she had got engaged to a man who went off on a polar expedition and uh, had to conduct their courtship largely through um, uh, letters. And then he came back and they got married in Great Victoria Street, but I think they had to postpone it for a day because of the, the snow. Much, yes. Yeah, snow was too was much. Road, was it Antrim Road they got married? Right, okay. Uh, 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 anybody else there? Who's the one next to you, Willie George? Who's next? This one here. <laughs> Where? <laughs> right. No, I'm thinking about this man here, Thomas. Thomas. Now, my wife came from Mahara, and she grew up in Tobermore Baptist Church, and she could always remember the Orr brothers going to the parties. So I don't know, you yeah, must have had a bit of a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyhow, let's move on then. So. Although Hugh was well versed in the scriptures and had been brought up in a Christian home, it wasn't until he was almost 18 in March 1922 that he was converted. He'd gone with some friends for a holiday and discovered that they had recently trusted in Christ as their saviour. When the time came to leave for home, one of them, Kennedy Waters, went part of the way with Hugh and at a crossroads near Koch. Is that... Does anybody recognise the crossroads? No? The crossroads near Koch. Um, Kennedy Waters spoke to Hugh about his need of the Saviour. Uh, in rural Ulster at the time, the crossroads was a place to transact business, whether settling a debt or pursuing a romance. And it was here that Hugh re repented of his sins, trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Saviour, and he was born again, adopted into God's family, a new creation in Christ. Now these were turbulent times politically. 
mean, we know this is 1920. No, this isn't. What a, this is 2023. So, and um, people are, well, those years, 1920, 21, 22, 23, were really turbulent politically um, in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, there was a lot of bloodshed and violence. Uh, Patrick Buckland in his history of Northern Ireland says that between June 1920 and June 22 there were over 2,000 victims of violence, 1,800 injured and over 200 killed. But those were, there were also days of spiritual awakening. In the early 1920s, the plain speaking evangelist W.P. Nicholson was holding missions throughout the province and many were coming to faith in Christ. Uh, someone I came across a quote saying that W.P. Nicholson was the rudest preacher he'd ever heard. So he did have quite a, a reputation for very blunt, plain speaking. But I, and throughout 1921, he held missions in Bangor, Portadown, Lurgan, Lisburn, Newtonards, and hundreds of people made professions of faith. In March 1922, he held missions in Belfast in several different churches. One eyewitness who attended the meetings in Newington Presbyterian Church recorded that on some evenings as many 2,000 people crammed into the building and as far as it was possible to tabulate, the, the converts of the mission numbered 1,100. It was in this context uh, that Hugh trusted in Christ. So you see some of the influences on him were his Christian family and home background his Christian friends who spoke to him about his personal need uh, of a saviour and this context of um, the ministry of W.P. Nicholson. Now, he didn't get involved in the politics of the time. I mean, many young men in Northern Ireland at the time did get involved. You know, that was a time when um, the B specials were formed and many uh, young men from a Protestant background felt it was their responsibility really to try and defend the newly formed state. But um, Hugh didn't get involved in politics. He found fellowship with a group of young men who met in the home of Master John McElrath, another school principal in Machrafelt, and they met for Bible study, prayer and fellowship. It was here that Hugh prayed publicly for the first time. He became actively involved in Christian service in his home church and also participated as a personal worker in some of W.P. Nicholson's campaigns. Following one of these campaigns in First Macrofelt Presbyterian Church, I think it was 1924, um, there was a Christian workers' union was formed at which Hugh was a, a regular speaker. It was also at this time that Hugh came under the influence of George McKillen, who had become the pastor of Tobermore Baptist Church in 1921. Hugh became convinced that the scriptures taught believers baptism, and so along with five other young men was baptised. This group began to pray about the possibility of starting a Baptist church in Machrafelt. In April 1926, a mission was held in Machrafelt, initially conducted by Pastor McKillen, and then by pastors Carcer and Burroughs. On Monday night, 8th of April 1926, Pastor Burroughs spoke on what is a Baptist church. He asked those interested to wait behind, and 13 did so. Among them, four of the six who had been baptized in Tobermore waited behind. It seems more than likely, although I don't really have any firm evidence for this, but it seems more than likely to me that Hugh was one of them and was one of the founding members of Machrafelt Baptist Church. Now, I don't know if, any, if there's anybody from Machrafelt here who knows any different. Um, that was the, apparently the original Baptist Church in Machrafelt. Um, I mean, I, I, I've got that information from... Um, Stanley Barnes's book on uh, the life of W.P. Nicholson. So, Pastor McKillen was instrumental then in setting up the South Derry Evangelistic Association towards the end of 1928. 
And Pastor Boggs from Tobermore has written an article about that, which is in the Baptist Historical Society journals. Uh, he persuaded the members of the Baptist churches in the South Derry area to contribute one penny each a week. And from these funds was, were purchased a horse-drawn caravan to provide accommodation for an evangelist, a portable hall, and later a tent. The evangelist was provided with a bicycle in which he could visit the homes in the district where the mission was being held. Hugh was appointed as the evangelist in the spring of 1931 at a salary of 15 shillings a week. He served in this capacity for just over two years and then resigned in July 1933, but continued to conduct missions independently. There is no reason given in the the minutes of the association, um, they record the, uh, that the committee feel and know that during his two years under the association, he has been much used of God in bringing souls into the kingdom and also building up those who are of the household of faith. And it is their earnest prayer that God may continue to use him mightily in his great name. And they also trust and pray that he may be kept in the place where it is only possible for God to bless and keep him. Uh, that's quoted by Pastor Boggs in that, that article. My own sort of feeling, and, and this is really just supposition, is that he was being asked to conduct missions in different places, you know, outside the South Derry area, and maybe that's why he resigned uh, from the South Derry Association so that he could take up these wider opportunities. So, this is Kilray Baptist Church, um, not as it was then, but I think this is it is as it is now today. The original. Uh, Baptist Church in Kilray, I think, is it down the Port Glenone Road? Yeah. Where? Yeah, Road. There, right. Is it, the building is still there? Yes. Yeah. So Hughes' preaching gifts were now being widely recognised. In November 1934, the church in Kilray uh, called him to be their pastor, and after prayerful consideration, Hugh accepted the call. But because he was committed to conducting several missions, he didn't take up the position until 12th of April 1935. He proved to be a very capable pastor. He was faithful in teaching God's word week by week, continued to hold missions in orange halls in winter and tents in the summer. Uh, the church grew steadily in spite of some opposition within the town. And it grew from a membership of 33 to 53 by the time he left in 1944. Many of the American servicemen who were stationed in that part of the province during the war found fellowship and hospitality in the church. One of them, Carl Anderson. Carl Anderson is... That's Carl Anderson. Um, recalls uh, how Hugh, finding him sitting on his doorstep reading his Bible one day, gave him a key and told him to let himself in any time. And they remained firm, lifelong friends. Um, this is Pastor Orr with his car. And I think he had a reputation for being quite a wild driver. Um, um, and there was something, was there a man? Uh, Armstrong, pastor, no, lay preacher, who was a sergeant in the police. Jimmy Armstrong. Jimmy. Jimmy. And who once had sent him a summons for careless driving, but it was all just a, a spoof kind of thing. <laughs> but he had suffered being driven somewhere by <laughs> HH and... Uh, but that was him. That was the house that, or the bungalow, I think, in Kilray that he, he lived in. And it's really in Kilray that my mother and father sort of got to know him at first. My fa uh, grandfather, my uh, mother's father, um, they had a, a farm near Kilray, 
he was a deacon in the church and later the church secretary in Kilray. My mother played the organ uh, in the church and uh, as a, she was only a teenager, I suppose, at the time. And um, uh, the opposition, uh, she told me, anyhow, apparently this wee building that they first met in had a corrugated iron roof. And uh, during the evening services in the summer, the local youths would gather outside and fire stones onto the roof and just to disrupt the services. But well, there was a bit of opposition. I have to say, some of the opposition came from my other grandfather, my father's father. Um, he, uh, he was a staunch member of the Church of Ireland. And when my father started going to the Baptist church, whether it was to hear the gospel or to pursue my mother, uh, I don't know what, but I think my father was converted at that time. And uh, his, his father didn't like that. He thought the, the Baptists were some kind of sect. And he actually, uh, well, really forced my father to leave home. My father was about 17 or 18 at the time. And uh, he, uh, my grandfather threw him out because he, he didn't like the Baptists. So, I mean, I think back then, 1930s, it would have been that kind of ill, Ill feeling from the more established mainline churches that looked upon Baptists as being something not quite respectable. So, in spite of the opposition, though, Pastor Orr, you know, built up the church there. But it's at this point, really, I want to introduce Mrs. Orr. This is a picture of uh, Hugh and May on their wedding day on the 20th of November 1935. May was from Kulshine. On the other side of Machrofelt was a qualified nurse and midwife in the Belfast Hospital. They conducted their courtship very discreetly and took many of their friends by surprise when they announced their engagement. The wedding ceremony was held in Templemore Hall and conducted by Pastor Paul uh, Tucker. They had a honeymoon in London and Edinburgh. They then set up home in Sandown. That was the, uh, the picture that I showed earlier. Um, uh, the bungalow in Kilray. A very happy marriage. I think only marred by the disappointment of not having any children of their own. Um, but they took great interest in their nephews and nieces who recall happy visits to Belfast and trips to the zoo. Now one of them, I don't know if it was you or who it was, but uh, one of them came back one day thrilled to have seen the biggest goose in the world, <laughs> only to be told that it was an ostrich. <laughs> Some of the, you or boys, you must have lived a fairly sheltered life, I think. I, I don't know, do you remember that? Or does any of you remember that? But that, that was, a, I'm not sure where that came from, whether that was in the scrapbook or, or, or what. But, you know, they, they did love children. They loved children. And I suppose that's my some of my memories of them. I remember, you know, we would have met them as a um, as a family. Well, maybe I should say this little bit uh, first. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Orr got married on 20th of November. Uh, yes, you know, I'll, I'll come back to that. But I can remember as a child having tea at Mr. and Mrs. Orr's house and um, afterwards we would play games. He, he played, we played card games, uh, donkey and old maid. And um, I can remember Mr. Orr, uh, he would have made up stories about me and my two sisters. My youngest sister, Alma, was Alma the alligator. My older sister, Hazel, was Hazel the hedgehog. But I was Leslie the lion. <laughs> so, uh, but I can remember them as a very, you know, that's why I, I grew up calling him my Uncle Hugh and my Auntie May, right? So th this is them getting married here. And uh, let me just say a bit about Mrs. Orr. She proved to be a real help 
in, in the work of the church, without a family to raise, no longer in employment. Uh, she wholeheartedly supported her husband in the life of the church. She acted as his secretary, took all the phone calls to the manse so that her husband was able to study without any interruptions during the morning. She was a great source of wisdom and practical help to the woman in the congregation, often using her medical skills. Uh, when leaving Kilray, the church commended her especially for all the work she had done with the children in the Sunday school. She often accompanied her husband when he was doing missions on door-to-door -door visitation. Uh, and she was a very capable speaker herself. Um, this is her here. Uh, now, she loved visiting graveyards. Uh, that was her kind of hobby. And um, in one talk, having described uh, her visits to Bunhill Fields in London, where Bunyan uh, was is buried, and the war graves in Normandy, uh, she then went on to talk about Joseph and the preparations he made for his physical burial and the need to make spiritual preparations for death as well. Then she concluded with the empty tomb of Jesus and the hope that the believer has in the face of death. So she was a, a, quite a, an accomplished speaker, a, a kind of unpaid personal assistant. I remember as a wee boy in Great Victoria Street, there were two aisles in the church and um, Mr. Orr would always go down to the door on one side and shake hands with people leaving and Mrs. Orr would go down to the door on the other side and shake hands with the people leaving. So she was totally involved. She was a very, she was a very capable woman. She was very sensible and very loving. She was a, a trained midwife and my uh, I don't personally remember this, but my sister Hazel tells me that it was Mrs. Orr who attended my mother. She, they were, I will come to this a bit later, but um, brought me into the world. She was the midwife who delivered me. And I would say that some years later, Mr. Orr was the spiritual sort of midwife who brought me to spiritual birth. But she was very capable. Now, my mother t told me one time that uh, one Sunday, Mr. Orr was taken ill just before church, the church service, and uh, they couldn't find anybody else to preach. So Mrs. Orr preached, and uh, she said later, she justified it by saying, well, she didn't want the sheep to go home unfed. <laughs> but it's not often a woman gets to preach in a Baptist church, but... She may have set a precedent, a precedent that I don't know if anybody has taken her up on that or followed her on that, but she was a very capable, very godly, uh, a lovely uh, woman and uh, devoted to her husband and greatly helped him in the ministry. On, the, um, on their 25th wedding anniversary, there's a bit about this, I think, in the scrapbook, uh, they made a return trip to London where they went for their, their honeymoon. On the Saturday evening, they attended a praise service uh, for the London City Mission in the Central Hall, Westminster. On Sunday morning, they went to Westminster Chapel to hear Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preach. In the evening, they went to the East London Tabernacle to hear the Reverend Paul Tucker. Uh, and then afterwards, to the West End Theatre, where Tom Rees was having evangelistic services. Here, Mr. Orr was impressed by the practice of sending out fishers of men to the surrounding streets in advance of the meeting to invite others to come in and thought that the practice could be used in missions at home. On the Monday evening, they attended the prayer meeting at the Metropolitan Tabernacle where Spurgeon had preached. So, nothing too frivolous on their second honeymoon, right? So... He was in uh, Kilray. Uh, are those men from Kilray? Yeah, you think so? Uh, so the, the, that's, you can see Mr. Orr there. Right. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, at the Baptist Union Assembly in 1943, concern was expressed about the lack of conversions and baptisms, and a committee was appointed to consider the appointment of an itinerant evangelist working under the auspices of the Home Mission. 
This led to an invitation to Hugh Orr to become the evangelist, which he accepted. He preached his farewell sermon in Kilray on the 10th of September 1944 and was formally commissioned as the home mission evangelist on the 14th. He and Mrs Orr moved to Belfast to a house on the Ormer Road, which they shared with a young newly married couple from Kilray um, who had moved to Belfast for work. Um, and that was my mother and father. So my mother and father were married on the 20th of November 1944. And Mr and Mrs Orr had left Kilray and they'd moved to Belfast. And they were living in a house near the bottom of the Ormer Road. Um, you may remember a few years ago there was a, a terrorist atrocity in uh, Sean Graham Bookmakers down near the bottom of the Warm Road. Well, the house next door to that was where my mother, my, Mr and Mrs Orr lived and where my mother and father lived in 1944 to 50, early 50s. So um, they shared the house together, I suppose, wartime, housing shortage. My father came to Belfast then to work as an electrician and uh, that's where I was born and apparently Mrs Orr delivered me. So, uh, um, so he, he began his work then as a home mission evangelist. Over the next two years he was extremely energetic in the work of evangelism. He held missions in Banbridge, Severick, Milltown, Lisburn, Limavady, Lurgan, Dungannon, Killyleigh, Guildford, Port Stewart, Colrain, Dromore, Balnahinch, Points Pass, Grange, Great Victoria Street and East End. So uh, you can, if you go back and look at the Irish Baptist magazine for those years, you can see every month there would be a report by uh, Pastor Orr on the mission that he had conducted. Um, let me just see. There was an account in Portadown of his mission there, and the um, the person writing it said he was. Um, he was very clear in his proclamation of the gospel and urgent in pleading with his hearers for decision, presenting our Saviour in plain, forceful language, as how one report put it. Everywhere he went, his ministry was marked by great fruitfulness. In June 1945, the Irish Baptist magazine reported over a hundred professions of faith as a result of the previous three months' missions. Mm -hmm. In his mission in Great Victoria Street in March 1946, such was the interest that as well as the weeknight meetings, they had two on Sunday evening, one at 6.30 and one at 8. Um, and somebody had the bright idea of broadcasting the service out onto the street, onto Great Victoria Street. But Mr Orr was not a great singer, to put it mildly. And uh, uh, apparently they forgot to switch the microphone off. So all the people out in the street could hear was Mr Orr's tuneless singing. So one deacon had to sprint up the aisle and get the microphone turned off very quickly. But in spite of little hiccups like that, you know, it was a very fruitful mission. Um, over 90 professions of faith were recorded during the three-week mission. In April 1946, he held a mission in the East End Church, which then led the church to call him as their pastor. Uh, he accepted the call, but his zeal for evangelism con uh, continued. In August 1947, he pre preached at an open-air meeting in the Botanic Gardens in Belfast to a crowd of over 7,000. That's what that photograph is. These meetings were held each summer under the auspices of the Irish Evangelistic Society, which brought men from different denominations together in gospel partnership. He continued throughout his pastorates to conduct missions not only in Ireland, but in several other places throughout the British Isles, London, other places in England, Scotland, Wales, there are little cards and, and things in, her, in, the, in the scrapbook um, publicising these missions. But he was called then to East End. Oh, well, well that, that's just, I was mentioning their friendship with my mother and father, so this was a bit further on, but that's my mother and father. 
there uh, on the left who, who were members at Great Victoria Street and that's another couple, Brian and Sheila Douglas. Uh, Brian was a, an elder in the church for quite a few years. Um, and just in case you don't recognize, <laughs> that's me, right? I've, I've matured a bit since then. Right? That was in our back garden, Sandhill Gardens, um, after my mother and father moved from the Ormer Road and the, the family increased. And I think my father was taking uh, the picture. Um, but East End. Um, so he commenced East End in 1946. Um, he preached faithfully twice on Sunday, again at the midweek meeting, and had a, later at a Friday evening Bible school. So hard work, hard work. You know, two sermons every Sunday, midweek, and then a Bible school as well. You know, he worked hard. Um, uh, the church building in East End had been badly damaged uh, during the German air raid in Belfast in May 1941 and the congregation joined with the church in Strandtown uh, for the next couple of years. Um, but within a few years of Pastor Orr arriving at East End, they would paid off all that they owed for the rebuilding of the church. Um, uh, and they purchased a, a manse in Rochester Avenue over uh, Craiga direction. He also found time to conduct evangelistic missions uh, in other churches. The church grew steadily. During his 11 years of ministry, there were 168 baptisms, and church membership grew from 82 in 1946 to 228 uh, in 1956. So I don't know what percentage or how you calculate that seems to be quite amazing growth uh, in the church. Um, Paul Doherty, who's now an elder in Valley Crocken, uh, he was a little boy in East End at the time, and it was under Pastor Orr's uh, preaching that he heard the gospel and was converted. Uh, and he recalls also how Pastor Orr encouraged his father Raymond uh, to start the work in Gilna Herc. It was during their time in East End that Pastor and Mrs. Orr, oh, let's do that. I think those are supposed to be the East End office bearers. I'm not sure if, if any of you are there. <laughs> Put your hand up. Okay, no, I, I don't know. That's just Mr. and Mrs. Orr. That was uh, Royal Avenue in 1946. But they, they went on a, the, the church gave them actually five months off in 1951, uh, and they went on a tour of, of America. They did many of the touristy type of things. Um, they crossed the continent, and they also, uh, he, but he found time to preach at this youth conference, Chinese Young People's Youth Conference in New Jersey conducted a 15-day mission in uh, Royal Roger Williams Baptist Church in L.A., uh, met up with, do you know, who, which, who are those two brothers that he's with there? I think it's Alfie one and Thomas. Thomas is the other. A couple of those brothers that, ha that he hadn't seen for about 30 years. And he ended up in Los Angeles and he renewed his... Uh, uh, friendship with W.P. Nicholson, who was teaching in the Biola University there. So came back then from uh, East End, uh, or from America, and uh, I better just hurry up a bit. Um, in that, June 1957, the Great Victoria Street Church called him to be their pastor. Uh, he was well known in the church. He'd conducted missions there in the past. He was a member there when he was working for the home mission. And uh, he accepted the call. He, he said that um, he read in Acts 13, 13, where John Mark turned back uh, to Jerusalem and his ministry became barren. 
and he felt that God was saying to him that he could not say no to the call. If he turned back, then his ministry would be barren. So he felt compelled. Uh, he felt God was definitely calling him um, to Great Victoria Street. Uh, in the, in uh, his induction service, he quoted 1 Corinthians uh, 127 God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty he appealed to the members not to depend on him for blessing but to look to God it is from him blessing will come the author of Great Victoria Street history comments in many respects he brought the warmth and friendliness of the Ulster countryman to his ministry and his strong accent reflected his background um, Apparently when a church in Great Victoria Street were considering uh, Pastor Orr, calling Pastor Orr, uh, some of them, um, this was a wee bit of departure from tradition because I think up until that time Great Victoria Street had always called a man from England who had some ministerial training and apparently at the time then some of them were a bit apprehensive about calling a man uh, who wasn't an Englishman, who had a very distinctive uh, country accent and who had very little formal education. So they approached Joshua Thompson and asked him about this man's grammar. And uh, to which Joshua Thompson replied, yes, he does have a strong uh, accent, but his grammar is impeccable. So he, he got the call and became pastor in Great Victoria Street. Uh, he followed the practice of his previous pastorates, prayer and ministry of the word, you know, preaching Sunday by Sunday, um, always biblically based, always clear and practical, often laced with humor. Uh, Sunday evening service was always a gospel address and no one was ever left in doubt that they needed to be saved. So that's when I, you know, I, mother and father took me to church every Sunday morning and evening. So between the age of nine and 16, uh, Pastor Orr was preaching. And every Sunday evening, I left the service knowing I needed to be saved. You know, that was absolutely clear, uh, urgent, compelling, um, that you must be born again. You, you need, you're a sinner, you need to be saved. Christ died for sinners. You need to trust in Christ. And that message came across clear, loud and clear, you know, every Sunday. Every Sunday. So, uh, and there was great blessing. I mean, uh, the church was full, you know, uh, my memories of it at that time. So that they had to develop the building. The church met in Wellington Hall for a year, 18 months or so while uh, they developed the building. Um, it was open, a new building was open in uh, 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 1963, I think it was. Um, uh, free of debt, I can remember the opening service. At the end of the service, one of the members, a Mr. W.J. McCormick, whose son, Hugh, is in the back row there this evening, stood up and said, uh, that you can take it, Pastor Orr, that this building is completely clear of debt. So whatever they still owed, Mr. McCormick pledged to cover. And, you know, going back to East End, they paid off the, the building. They got it bought a manse. So he seemed to have been able to motivate the congregation to give and to give generously. Um, as w because I think they had confidence in him and they were blessed uh, by his ministry. Um, this was the opening of the building. These were some of the Bible class syllabus. Um, had this Bible class every Friday night. Um, George Johnson, some of you may know, was an elder, wasn't he? In, uh, Windsor and at this time at this stage he was a student, medical student at Queen's and of course he later went on to become a consultant and a surgeon but he invited Pastor Orr to come and speak to the Christian Union at Queen's 
And then he felt, as a, as a date approached, he got a bit worried because here was this man with his strong country accent, his tuneless singing, and his plain blunt speaking. And how would the students at Queen's, these young intellectuals, how would they respond to Pastor Orr's preaching? But he needn't have worried. He went down a storm. And in fact, many of the students then would have come along to the Friday evening uh, Bible class. Um, another development which took place under his pastorate was the starting of the church in Finnehe. You know, so he, he was a church planter long before it became the fashionable thing to be doing. Right? Um, during Pastor Orr's ministry, many conversions, although no records really were kept of that. There were 380 baptisms, though, during those nine years or so that he was there. Uh, the church membership grew to 527. Um, 1960, there was the This Is Your Life uh, uh, presentation. Um, and they also had a special dinner uh, for Mrs. Orr, Mr. and Mrs. Orr's silver wedding anniversary, at the end of which a bouquet of flowers was presented by Miss Alma Hutchinson, <laughs> my younger sister, who was age six at the time. Right. But Pastor Orr's health you know, was a matter of concern since 1964 when he had a, suffered a heart attack um, and been incapacitated for three months. He appeared to make a good recovery but again suffered serious heart problems uh, in the early part uh, of 1966. So he ended up frequently um, in hospital with this heart condition. Um, there, one of the consultants that treated him was a Professor Pantridge, which you may have heard of, who was responsible for the defibrillator, and apparently he was quite a fearsome man. So he would walk down the ward to where Pastor Orr was in the bed and say to him, perhaps sarcastically, perhaps respectfully, he would just look at him and say, well, how's the man of God today? And... Uh, Pastor Orr had built up a bit of a uh, uh, relationship with him. Um, but because of his health, he informed the church that he had to sort of take semi-retirement. So he moved to Rathcoo. Sorry, that was, uh, that's him on his tour of the Holy Land. I don't know who they all are, but I think that's him. Is that him up there somewhere? And Mrs. Orr is over there. Um, so he moved to Rathcool in his retirement. Um, uh, you met, some of you, you know Philip de Corsi, who's pastor out in America now. His mother and father were members of the church. And Philip remembers his mother telling him uh, about this illustration that Pastor Orr used. Uh, she said that speaking about the need to keep growing in the Christian life, Pastor Orr said it was like riding a bicycle with no brakes uphill. If you didn't keep moving forward, you would go back. Um, so those were the kind of illustrations that he used. I mean, he, another sermon he was speaking about uh, Jesus stilling the storm uh, on the lake in Mark 4. And, you know, Jesus says, you know, be still. And he, he said how he was doing visitation around some of the farms in the countryside. And he came into this farmyard and this uh, sort of mongrel came rushing out, barking and snarling. And he feared for his life that it was about to sink its teeth into his leg. And the farmer came out uh, of, of the barn and, and just said, be quiet, lie down. And the dog just lay down totally submissive at his feet. So those were the kind of illustrations that he used, very practical, very homely, uh, able to get the point across. So he went into retirement then and has lived at Orangefield, just beside where Orangefield Baptist Church is, and then he died um, so, Sunday, Saturday the 10th of November 1973. Uh, Pastor Boggs wrote, no doubt the trumpet sounded for him, and the other side, as he heard the master's own tribute, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thy into the joy of the Lord. Um, Pastor Thompson 
uh, paid a tribute. I won't, I won't go through it all uh, now. Our time really has gone. But in the middle of it, he said that um, his sermons were concise, coherent, and often memorable. Some of his outlines were strikingly original. One that was typical was related to Samson, the Old Testament character. It had three telling points. Long hair, no hair, short hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I think I, I'll, I'll just draw to an end there. You know, Hugh Orr came from a very humble background. He was brought up on a small farm in Mid-Ulster. He lost his father when he was only a boy. He had only the most basic formal education. But as a young man, he committed himself to serving his Lord and Saviour with his whole heart. He devoted himself to the ministry of the word and prayer. He was greatly gifted and zealous in the work of evangelism. And many came to faith in Christ as they heard him preach the gospel. He was a clear and faithful Bible teacher who made the scriptures plain and understandable to all. He was a wise and loving pastor and leader, greatly respected by all who knew him. He, along with his wife, gave counsel support uh, and practical support to many. They faced difficulties and disappointments with courage and faithfulness. Society and church life and ministry have changed enormously since, uh, in the 60 years since Pastor Orr's death, but his life and ministry leave us an example to inspire and imitate.